All right, welcome everyone. If um, everyone on the call, if you can hear me, welcome. If you could just uh, put your um, devices to mute, we greatly appreciate that. And we're going to we're going to make a start. We don't want to listen to this. It's the IHI. Lynette, do you want to listen to it? Want to have it on that speaker? Oh, it doesn't worry. I mean, it doesn't worry me. Okay. Well, if, everyone, if everyone could go to mute, we'd appreciate that. I don't mind. Okay, if we could all go to mute. Brilliant. Thank you, everyone. Um, look, we, we're going to make a start. We've got a um, really um, jam-packed um, hour together, and um, we'll make a start. So welcome, everyone. Uh, kia ora, Jinjeri, and uh, welcome to today's webinar, The Future of Housing, uh, with um, our guest, Victorian Minister for Housing and Planning, Mr Richard Wynne, and our panel today. It's great to have you all with us. Uh, firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we collectively meet on today, we recognise traditional custodians' continued connection to land, water and community, and I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Mark Henderson and I'm the CEO of AHI. Uh, for 20 years, the AHI has focused on the professional development of our members and the industry as a whole. Today, we're proud to say we've got 2,297 members that we work with. And these are the professionals, people like yourselves, who are focused on delivering innovative, social and affordable housing solutions across Australia and New Zealand. Uh, today's discussion is about learning about the significant, important investment being made in social and affordable housing. And it's also uh, about a discussion on the human capital that will be required to drive the sector into the future, which is clearly our area of interest. We're going to throw a poll check up there, a, poll, a pulse check via a poll in a second for you to respond to. We've got 132 registered participants in today's webinar. And, and really interestingly, 60% of those are coming from outside Victoria. So clearly yeah. what the Victorian government is doing is, great, is of great interest and I sense great admiration. As many of you know, the Victorian government announced in late 2020, Victoria's largest investment in the social housing system and will include 5.3 billion in new and additional investment producing 9,300 social homes and 2,900 mainly affordable low-cost homes. It's a further 1.38 billion delivered through the Social Housing and Growth Fund over the next four years to support up to 4,200 new dwellings. This is coupled with the government's deployment of the 10-year housing strategy, which is currently in development. It's really an exciting time for our sector, particularly in Victoria. So let me go to our panel, first of all. Um, Minister Richard Wynne has been, we're really grateful for his time today. He's the Minister for Housing, Minister for Planning, and has a long distinguished career representing the inner Melbourne electorate of Richmond since 1999. He's also been Minister for Aboriginal Affairs, Minister for Multicultural Affairs, Minister for Local Government. He's a former Lord Mayor of Melbourne, City of Melbourne Councillor. He's also been a, an advisor to local councils and government. Minister Wynne studied social work and criminology at Melbourne Uni and after graduating worked for seven years in community health on inner city public housing estates. Minister Wynne, firstly, thank you for your tireless public service clearly and on behalf of our members and guests, thank you for your time today. Oh, thanks very much, Mark. Um... I'm up and away now. I, I, I've just introduced the rest of the panel, Minister. And then All I'll right, sorry, yep. you. Yeah, no, you're okay. No uh, Trudy, Trudy Ray is also on our panel today. Uh, Trudy is the Deputy CEO and Chief Operating Officer of Haven Home Safe. Haven, Haven offer a variety of housing and support services to people in housing crisis across 29 local government areas in regional and metro Victoria. Trudy is the Victorian Director of the AHI. She's also a member of the AHI Victorian Branch Committee and she's chair of Chia Victoria. She's a recent graduate of Harvard Business School, the Executive Leadership Program. And I can say this very confidently, Trudy is making a huge impact on the sector and a real champion of transformational change. Trudy, welcome. Um, Luke Beauchere is the Executive Director Strategy Partnerships and Governance Branch uh, within the newly formed Homes Victoria. Luke's role includes the partnership between Homes Victoria and local government and community housing providers, as well as the overall policy direction and strategy for Victoria's social and affordable housing system. Prior to joining Homes Vic in March 2020, 
Luke held roles in the Commonwealth Government, NDIS and not-for-profit housing sector. Luke, welcome to you. Um, Thanks, Mark. Last but not least, an Australian of the Year finalist, Steve Bevington, founder and managing director of Commuting Housing Limited, has been involved in the development and management of affordable and community housing for over 40 years. Steve has led CHL from a one worker organisation to now managing over 11,000 properties, making it the largest community housing provider in Australia with operations across six states and many international markets and has nearly 300 staff delivering services to those most disadvantaged. Steve, welcome. Um, unfortunately, Darren Smith, CEO of Aboriginal Housing Victoria, wasn't able to join the call uh, with us today. So before I uh, hand over to Minister Wynne, uh, today is about interaction and asking, asking questions of the minister and the panel. There are two ways you can do that. You can raise your hand using the Zoom function for that and ask the question live. So be brave, we like to see some live questions. Or two, you can use the chat function and I'll ask you on um, and I can ask those questions on your behalf. We'll do our very best to address as many as possible. We're recording today's webinar and a copy of the recording will be made available to each one of you via our member platform. I'm now gonna hand over to Minister Wynne for an introductory address and then we're gonna open questions to the panel. Minister Wynne. Oh, Mark, thank you very much. Um, uh, and also acknowledging Steve Bevington and Trudy as well. Um, uh, as is our tradition here, I also want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the, of the land on which um, I'm, uh, I'm having this conversation today, which is the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations. Uh, and I pay, I pay my respects to elders uh, past, present and emerging and any other elders who are on, uh, on, the, uh, on this webinar today, both uh, from Victoria, interstate, and I think even uh, New Zealand, I, I understand, Mark. So we Correct. acknowledge our friends as well. Uh, what do they say? Across the ditch, I think it's called. <laughs> so, um, but I'm really pleased um, to be with you. Um, uh, this is a, a it's an important uh, conversation uh, to be had because uh, the Australian Housing Institute is celebrating its 20th anniversary this year. I mean, it's, it's fantastic. And really, you've spent 20 years building the organisation, but really helping the people who work in social, affordable and community housing, help people who live in social, affordable and community housing. And I guess your mission uh, can really be summed up uh, in really three words, educate, empower and inspire. Uh, and I couldn't think of a better mission statement. Obviously, as housing minister, uh, I'm in the business of educating, empowering and inspiring also. Uh, it's just that I'm focusing on a different part of the system. You're empowering the people who work in social, affordable and community housing. And Mark, as you indicated, um, uh, this, this is where I really started my career, um, working in this sector and... Um, I, I, and it's, it's an area that um, I will always look back uh, incredibly fondly on um, as uh, kind of really establishing myself um, uh, and probably my bona fides for want of a better word um, in uh, housing provision more generally. So, uh, <coughs> pardon me. Um, uh, Obviously, the work, your work and uh, my work are inextricably uh, entwined with each other. Uh, and I think that connection is incredibly important because uh, we can have a social housing system and building it, and that's, that's uh, exactly what we should be doing. But it's the people who actually manage and support the system who are so fundamental, uh, not just in terms of... Um, uh, organisations like Steve and others that have grown amazingly to become really significant players, but never forgetting that at the heart of what we do um, is helping uh, people into the dignity of a safe, affordable and secure property. Uh, and as we know, this becomes a transformational thing. Uh, if you can provide people um, with a safe, affordable and secure residence, they 
their opportunity is immensely enhanced. And I know just, I know, I mean, I've known Steve for a very long time and others who will be on this call. Um, and I know the deep commitment that pe that everyone on this call has got to, to really the, the principles that have always guided all of us. I mean, essentially principles around social justice. And I call all of you out today and acknowledge you all. <coughs> Pardon me. So last year at the height of the lockdown, uh, the Economic Society of Australia surveyed our leading economists and asked them to nominate four priority areas for government spending coming out of COVID. Uh, and none of you will be surprised, according to these economists, uh, the top priority had to be social housing. And we all know why. After all, with interest rates at historic lows, the cost of building social housing has never been uh, more opportune. Not only that, investing in social housing obviously creates work and jobs in the construction industry, very important in terms of the workforce, clearly addresses the, the, the fundamental social justice challenge of homelessness and social hardship more generally, uh, which is so important to our community. Uh, it also increases uh, the money social housing residents have to spend uh, uh, more broadly in the economy, and that always is a good thing as well. Frankly, these, in, these investments, you know, people talk about the triple bottom line, but uh, everybody wins in this uh, scenario. And Mark, that's why the 5.3 million, 5 million, let me try again, 5.3 billion, hard to, get, hard to get that number out, isn't it? I yeah, mean, it's, right. it's, it's an amazing number. Uh, we're investing in the big housing build frankly, is the best possible way uh, to strengthen our workforce, our community, and the economy more generally. And as Mark, you indicated in your introductory comments, uh, in, in the next four years, the, the big housing build will deliver more than 12,000 new homes across metropolitan regional Victoria. Uh, and we expect over that four-year period, uh, not just in the provision of housing, but also uh, the job outcome is going to be incredibly important. All of these new homes, uh, <coughs> pardon me, will meet seven star energy efficiency ratings, uh, which is important. Uh, and Victoria's total social housing supply will be boosted by a full 10%. Uh, in addition, as you indicated, Mark, in your introductory comments again, we're developing a 10 year social affordable housing strategy to really maximize the long-term benefits of this transformational investment. But we're also giving the planning system its biggest reboot as well since the 1980s, ensuring the system has time to focus on projects of state significance uh, and that the public interest comes first uh, as it always should. In short, I would, I would put to the group today that the big housing build here in Victoria is without question uh, a game changer. We know uh, that this is the biggest commitment by a state or federal government ever uh, to the provision of public and social housing. So that's where we're coming from. Uh, let me give you a little bit of an insight, if I can, Mark, into how we're traveling. Um, obviously, projects of this scope and size usually take some time to get rolling. Uh, uh, but frankly, the big housing build has really surprised us and keeps surprising. Initially, we expected to boost our social housing stock by about 1,100 dwellings this financial year, but we were way, way wrong. And we blew that, we blew that target out months ago. Uh, and we'll, we'll have some further announcements to make about that. It's no longer 1,100, it's way north of 1,100. We've also been impressed by the um, incredible response uh, from the private market as well. The first funding round of the Social Housing Growth Fund was not surprisingly oversubscribed. Uh, and we want these projects to be underway by the end of this year. Uh, and that's really important because for those who are outside of Victoria at the moment, you know, we are easing out of lockdown and literally, uh, literally as we speak now, the Acting Premier will be making some announcements of further relaxation uh, which is a good thing, um, but you know we, we've done it tough here in Victoria, um, but we are a resilient state 
um, and we will we will get out of um, this latest challenge that we've got. Um, but we know that we have to ensure that that economic activity actually is an important stimulus um, to lifting our economy and employment as well. And that's and there is no greater um, stimulus that can be can be put in place that effectively uh, ensures um, Sorry, Minister, we might have um, just lost sound for a second. Oh, am I back again? No, you're back. You're back. How much did, how much did we miss? Oh, I think about 10 seconds worth. Oh, right. Uh, <laughs> so I was, talking, I was talking about how important the, um, the economic stimulus stuff is, and I mean, and it's self-evident to all of you. Um, yep. um, that's why the $5.3 billion, uh, we wanted to make sure that 25% of it um, uh, was absolutely targeted to regional Victoria. So we've got a broad spread uh, of, uh, of activity right across uh, Victoria. And uh, all of the, uh, whether it's a social housing growth fund or all of the investments uh, to date, uh, we wanna make sure that all of the state uh, actually gets a fair share of it. Mark, you talked about developing a 10 year strategy for social and affordable housing. Um, as I'm sure many people on the call will know, we did release a discussion paper, uh, and frankly, that's had a fantastic response. We've had 300 survey responses and a full 170 submissions. I think um, it'd be fair to say there's no more passionate group of people than, uh, than people who are working in the uh, public and social housing sector. Uh, and I'm just you know, really delighted uh, with the feedback uh, that we've actually got to date. And that's going to help us shape not uh, the strategy moving forward um, to ensure that we, we have um, a, a real pathway that we can all understand as to how uh, we can ensure uh, both the stability and, and long-term viability of our public housing system, uh, but also a growth strategy for social housing as well. Um, I could probably... No, I don't know if you, how much longer do you want me to go, Mark. I, I can talk a fair bit about some of the projects. Um, uh, actually, I'm going to talk. I'm going to embarrass Steve Bevington here because uh, I could have talked about some other stuff that we've done. Uh, but one of the things that was has been uh, pretty amazing uh, is the ground lease model that we've put in place, uh, which is a Australian. Uh, well, it's not the first it's been done, but it's the first ground lease model that's ever been um, undertaken at any scale. Uh, and I want to acknowledge the work of Steve Bevington, uh, particularly today, uh, when he told the Financial Review that CHL uh, will use the income from uh, the deal that we uh, have put in place to invest in new social housing, potentially doubling or quadrupling uh, the 1,100 new homes we're building uh, under this new ground lease model, which is absolutely fantastic. So th this model uh, is very innovative. There are an enormous um, group of partners uh, and uh, the way this has been brought together has really harnessed, um, I think, a new, a new vision, frankly, for how we go about the provision of social housing, but ensuring that uh, over time, um, because we have a tripartite arrangement between CHL, the government, uh, and, um, uh, and uh, the developer private sector um, investors, uh, Steve would say, I think, uh, potentially after 12 years, uh, we will end up in a profit share arrangement. And at the end of the leasing arrangement, um, all of the properties come back, to, uh, come back to the state. Very, very innovative uh, proposal. Um, I just want to touch briefly on homelessness. Uh, this has been uh, a really, uh, again, a really uh, leading edge initiative by the government. Um, and this has been uh, very, very challenging work where at, at the height of the lockdown, uh, we were accommodating close to 1,800 people um, in hotels. Uh, we've probably got close to that figure again. Uh, and there were people on this call and I, and I just say to the 
all of the partners, 33 partners who have delivered who are delivering our homeless to a home package. Um, I'm in. Um, I take my hat off to you. You're doing fantastic work, um, and we are stabilising people in um, in the hotels, uh, and then uh, really uh, triaging them uh, into long-term accommodation. Uh, this is this is a uniquely Victorian initiative uh, by our department and uh, Sherry Brunhout and others who are at the front line of that. I want to call them out today for the work that they have done. Luke Bashir is going to be on the panel with me who helped design this. I mean, it's, uh, it's fantastic work, um, but it is incredibly challenging work. People don't choose homelessness as a lifestyle. Um, people come into homelessness for a whole range of reasons. Um, uh, family breakdown, uh, family violence, um, drug and alcohol, mental health. I mean, you know all that. Um, so uh, the work we're doing there um, is groundbreaking. Uh, and I think that it, um, uh, we will, we won't end rough sleeping, but, I, uh, but we will really make a significant impact um, uh, in the lives of many people who have done it incredibly hard for a very long period of time. I'm going to stop there, Mark, um, and I think that would probably do me for the outset, and I, I very much look forward to the conversation. Yeah, thank you, Minister Wynne. That was fantastic, and it's um, you know I think I think we collectively feel proud to be part of this sector, and as you said, social justice is at the heart of what we do, and I think we're doing an outstanding job. Absolutely. Um, qu question um, uh, more more broadly, um, and then we might narrow it down on a couple of different areas. Sure. I, th I think we're seeing um, in, even through this conversation that we've got a lot of um, cutting edge, bleeding edge thinking and strategy being developed throughout Victoria to, um, to address some of these challenges, challenges, yep. homelessness, um, more stock and the like. Um, and clearly just in this small um, demographic, we're seeing a lot of interest minister from around Australasia for what's happening in Victoria. Could you see this being picked up and replicated across these these markets? Oh, I think there are real opportunities here. Um, uh, as I say, the ground lease model is the first it's ever been done at scale. I think New South Wales may have done a smaller version of this, I think New South Wales, um, but not at this scale. Um, Steve, I think it's what, 1100, uh, how many properties all up? Uh, there's 1100 properties, 1100. which mm -hmm. could expand up to 2300. Yeah. Through re reinvesting the component of the profits we create yeah, yeah. out of it. Yeah, which and is quadrupled if uh, the government wants to share in that. That's the government of the day at the time, 12 years on. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it invites a response, but I'll let that go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, will, I will reinforce this as being recorded as well, just, yeah, just in case. So uh, let's. Um, <laughs> let's, uh, let's let's go um, just just on that Steve um, and I, and I, I believe I know the answer but um, one of the questions coming from the audience was the uh, beyond the 1100 um, stock that CHL build they will go back to the government at the end of the, yes. the lease program correct yes it will that's right yeah. it's uh, after the 40 year lease it becomes the 1100 go back to government that's right yeah um, Minister, just a, a question without notice um, sure, you mentioned you mentioned that your progress is north of where you thought it was going to be, uh, um, beyond the 1100. So two, two parts of the question. What, what's, what's occurred that's made that um, made uh, the success greater in the period? What's, what's happening inside the sector that you're seeing? Second question is, as a, as a minister responsible, what's keeping you awake at night as you think about the big build and the 10-year strategy, if you don't mind sharing that with, with the audience? Yeah. Uh, what's keeping me awake at night, Mark, is COVID. Yeah. <laughs> Frankly. Yeah. Um, uh, but in, in our, I mean, uh, yeah, many people on this call have been around the public and social housing arena for as long or longer than me. Uh, and, uh, you know, just sometimes, you know, you hit a sweet spot. You know, we've talked in the past forever about things like superannuation funds. Now, my, um, my journey in this goes back, you know, to when I was, um, you know, advising the, um, the great urbanist himself, Brian Howe, 
when we were trying to get superannuation funds to engage with um, the social housing sector um, and get getting them to invest. Um, uh, and I have to say, we were we failed um, because it was all about at the end of the day, you know, fiduciary duty and return and so forth. And and I get all that. I completely understand that. But now we're in a different environment where you've got historically low interest rates, and you've you've um, you know to the great credit of uh, AHI and others, you've actually brought people along on the journey to because when when we talked in the in those earlier days about <coughs> the not for profit and social housing sector, people had no idea what we're talking about. I said, well, hang on, what's all this about? We don't, we don't understand this. Who are they? Well, what's what underpins them? Yeah, you know, what's their governance? <coughs> Pardon me. And you know, you were kind of starting from ground zero, Mark. Whereas now, um, you know, you've got you know really significant organisations. I mean, I don't want to keep um, signing CHL out, but there, there are a number of you know, our social housing providers that are big, big operations with, um, you know, very strong governance, very strong balance sheets, um, and uh, a willingness and capacity um, to engage at an equal level with financiers, um, and to really being able to sit at the table with uh, an incredible level of both experience and confidence um, in what they can deliver. And I think that's been an enormous change, but it's taken, you know, frankly, it's taken 20 years to get us here, but gee, we're here now. Yeah. So, so would you regard it, and I'm going to throw this one out to you, um, Trudy, just from your perspective, <coughs> you've got, uh, uh, your organisation's got a large footprint across Victoria. D do you see what's happening now as a, a, as a tipping point, I suppose, for the social and affordable housing sector in, in Victoria? Great. Thank you, Mark. And thank you, Minister. I think what we're absolutely seeing is meaningful system change that is addressing the shortages of social and affordable housing across um, Victoria that is impacting the vulnerable. And as a homeless organisation as well, we absolutely understand the demand um, across the state. But I think the most pleasing thing that we're seeing is the driving of the long term and widespread change that we are seeing in, in public policy. But the regional investment, in particular in regional Victoria, that we're seeing in the 25% um, will absolutely explore the current shortfalls in, in the regions. And with the COVID environment, there's many more people coming into that market, flooding that market. And as a consequence, uh, the demand uh, for housing and certainly the specialist homelessness services have risen in the past 12 months in those areas. So it's really pleasing uh, to see the the work and the investment that's happening, particularly in regional Victoria. I mean, I'm a massive, ad for those of you that know me, I'm a massive advocate for regional Victoria. So um, the people-centred strategic vision uh, that the government's putting in place and increasing that supply through a variety of those mechanisms and partnerships and the collaboration across the social and housing um, sector and the complementary nature of the work that we do really goes to the forefront of the deep commitment to social justice that Minister Wynne was talking about previously. Yeah, brilliant. And Luke, let me just bring you in there because um, uh, Trudy referenced strategy and uh, and, the, and the like for the sector. This is clearly in your role as the ED uh, strategy and partnerships. Um, what, what are you seeing from the inside out? How, how are you and your team and the department engaging with the sector for the rollout of this strategy, both the four and the 10 year? Great. Thanks very much, Mark. And, you know, certainly from our perspective, that system change perspective that Trudy spoke about is really at the heart of um, the 10 year strategy. The, the, the minister spoke about what a historic investment this is and certainly it will, it will grow stock so significantly. We know that that's an opportunity not just to have more housing, but to have a better housing system and a system that works more effectively for Victorians who need it the most. So the 10-year strategy really is looking at how do we make this investment 
grow the system, but also change the way the system works. And that's really about putting tenants and residents at the heart of the system and putting them at the center and really focusing on outcomes. And a lot of the discussion at the moment is obviously about the, the numbers of properties that have built the, the economic impact. But we know that the next stage of that is people moving into these properties and, and that really transforming the lives of people. And so the 10 year strategy will look at some of those issues. How do we get the right supports in place for people? so that people are able to live their fullest life in moving into this housing and it has the biggest social impact for people. Um, and the other part of it is also the role of the community housing sector. So obviously in, in the growth of this package, so much of the package really relies on a partnership with community housing. So the 10 year strategy will also look at how do we build and strengthen the community housing sector given this package will see a 30% growth in the asset base of, of community housing, which is a great, a great thing for the not-for-profit community housing sector, but how do we think about the role of the sector and further strengthening their role? Um, and, and linked to that is the review of the regulatory system yeah. in Victoria, which will also make sure that community housing providers are supported to grow, but also that we've got the right regulatory system in place for, for tenants um, in, in this new environment. Yeah, thank you, Lucas. Steve, could, could you um, just add any comment on that uh, regulatory um, that change and, and where that's going from a sector perspective as a, as a key participant? Um, well, first, I'd like to take my hats off to uh, the Victorian government and particularly the minister who has driven this step change in uh, the development of social and affordable housing in this state, which is really important. And it's tremendous. I mean, if you think about it, there was 5.9 billion invested nationally 10 years ago in the nation building program yeah. and the Victorian government is investing 5.3 billion, which is a huge, you know, it's incredible for a state to actually do that. So to start off, I think all, it gives the lead to all other states in Australia and hopefully Australasia as well. Um, I also would like to say that uh, um, there's, along with that has been this great partnership, which has been proposed by Homes Victoria, it's given life to the compact between the sector and the government. And there's a genuine working relationship emerging, uh, which is how to take things forward once this stimulus package has been uh, expended as such. And it's the years from year four to year 10, which we will be focusing on and how to continue that growth. And Briefly, I'd just like to say one of the great things that happened uh, and to follow on from what the minister said about superannuation funds is that when we started to field uh, discussions with financiers on the public housing renewal program, there were some 30 financiers involved in the bond issue there and things have really changed now. And as a result of 15 years of regulation, we now have absolutely dependable income streams and we can show the financing sector that this is absolutely a firm return and that we have evidence to prove that over a long period of time. And that also uh, with the government guarantees that come into the funds from both the Victorian government and the national housing Finance and Investment Corporation, NIFIC, uh, we have this debt financing capability. So now these equity funds, superannuation funds can come in and consider that investing equity in the sector is the equivalent of investing cash. And this is the great change that can occur. And I believe that the future is about institutional investment combining with debt finance, guaranteed debt financing, which will drive the continued growth of funds. And quite simply, I think we need to look at Victoria and say the 5.3 billion is a very good start for government and we need to attract another 65 billion to resolve not just getting up to the national average, but resolving the affordable housing needs for Victorians. Brilliant. Thank you, Steve. Um, we've got a, um, a couple of questions coming through uh, by our chat. Um, uh, Minister Aluk, I think this one is um, for you. Uh, it would be good to understand, so a question from Kate is, it would be good to understand how the recommendations from the Mental Health Inquiry will inform and align with the 10-year strategy 
and if larger state capacity initiatives can be ongoing rather than three projects as they have been making great improvements. Minister, Luke? Yep. Um, so in the first instance, um, we, we committed um, uh, through the work of the Royal Commission uh, that we would fund uh, directly uh, 1100, Luke? I think 2000, Minister. 2000 properties. Wow. 2000, no, it's 11, yes, in the other sectors, um, family violence. Family Two, violence. Uh, yeah, 2000 properties um, for uh, uh, our residents uh, on the waiting list um, who are suffering the challenges of, um, uh, of mental health. Uh, and that was, uh, I think, really important uh, that we, uh, that we uh, provided uh, that, that, uh, that announcement because as part of the Royal Commission's work, they absolutely understood the centrality of housing. Um, that for people who are, uh, and you know, as we know, uh, we've got many people today who are in our hotels, who who are suffering from the challenges of um, of of mental health, and and you and we absolutely everyone on this call knows it's a self evident truth that if you provide people provide a person with safe, affordable and secure housing and wrap around them the services to support them in their tenancy, people will, um, can and will get better. Uh, yeah. And uh, that's, you know, that's a self-evident truth, Mark. And, um, I'm, you know, I'm really very pleased with uh, how we have allocated both to uh, mental health, but also to family violence uh, and to Aboriginal housing as well. So we've got... Um, commitments to those other two very, very important areas uh, of, of uh, support. Yeah. Um, and just a, just a question from a little bit earlier from uh, Nick Lotter in, up in New South Wales. Um, he, he just comments about the, the new dwellings, which uh, with the seven star rating minister, a great, yep. great, great tribute, great, great strategy, great approach. What, what accessible level uh, livable housing was prescribed? Uh, do you know, or Luke, do you know on, on, those, on those dwellings? Well, we had a um, we actually had a breakthrough, Mark, um, which l largely went unheralded. Um, so um, I've been advocating for more accessible house as a minister for planning in this context, because it's a building minister's um, issue. Um, this, the building code of Australia will be amended um, uh, uh, over the next two years uh, to put in place um, minimum minimum standards of accessibility um, uh, and that's in spite of the fact that um, you know there were some jurisdictions um, across uh, the country that resisted it um, uh, for whole ranges of reasons but um, we managed to yes. <coughs> we, we managed to get um, a majority of states to support this so um, uh, the building code of Australia will reflect in the next couple of years, I mean, it has to be phased in, obviously, um, a, a new uh, code of accessibility. Yeah, great, fantastic, thank you. Um, I've got a question um, for, for Trudy Ray. Um, I'm hearing um, expansion, uh, increase in sophistication, uh, Minister just mentioned wraparound services, more dwellings, we're gonna have a bigger sector. The availability of talent <laughs> now is on a on a global basis and clearly we're interested in the human capital mm. trudy how do we go about as a sector victoria and and also across um australia new zealand how do we attract the best and brightest in, into the social and affordable housing sector what, what are your thoughts around that great great question thanks mark i think it's something that certainly plagued us as an industry for such a long time and because housing is not necessarily a career that you uh, you know start off as your career and go into it's kind of something everyone's fallen into but looking at the names on my screens we've all been in this business for quite some time so the retention once we actually get people into the sector the retention rates are incredibly high and I think it's because 
the commitment, the passion, uh, the evolution of this sector has just been one that, you know, is incredibly exciting. So I suppose there's that element, but it's also about how do we as, as an industry, as a sector, really try and, um, I suppose, communicate and market the advantages to the, to the sector. And we're all working on it. I know the AHR are working on it, Chair Vic is certainly working on it. Um, and one of the elements that is so great with the big housing build is the uh, sector development fund and the opportunity that we have as a sector combined to come up with um, uh, new projects and new ways uh, of using that money collectively to look at developing the workforce for the future. And I know that is a project that um, we'll, we'll commence shortly, but it's really about um, raising the profile of housing and uh, as a career, because it's a fantastic career. Um, you know, yes, it keeps us up at night, as we know, and it, it is really challenging and, and seeing the changing nature of the vulnerable is certainly something that, that hits home and is really, you know, difficult at times, but also the lens of the ever changing environment in which we are lucky to find ourselves in with incredible policies um, like the big housing build, I think uh, we are in that momentum shift where we can start to absolutely emphasise uh, that it is a career and is certainly a career for life. And as I said, the sector is currently working working on that. Um, but a call out, you know, we do have a lot of um, professors in the field and, you know, even the Swinburne University housing course, that is no longer offered. Um, so in this state, we have a real gap in um, educational resources for this um, this sector. So I think that's certainly something that we combined can start working on closing that gap. Yeah, yeah, spot on, spot on. Uh, Minister, just a question from the floor, um, really good one, and I, and I think I know the answer as well. Have you been inundated with uh, requests for detail on your initiatives from the other state and territory counterparts? Yeah, we have, Mark. Um, but also, interestingly, um, I think if Sherry Brunhout was on here, Luke, um, um, our friends in Scotland are mm. particularly interested in what we're doing around the homeless initiative, um, uh, which is fantastic. So uh, it is, you know, it's, you know, as I indicated, it's very challenging work. But gee, I mean, you know, when when we complete this program, um, you know, we're going to house, you know, literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people um, who have, um, you know for want of support, been sleeping in the most vulnerable um, of circumstance. Um, so, um, but it's not just housing them, it's ensuring we've got the supports there to maintain their tenancy. This is a fundamental shift that yeah. we're making here. And I think that's uh, fantastic. Um, you know, I, I indicated the uh, the ground lease model is, 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 is something that I think other states um, uh, will seek to look at. Um, Unfortunately, we don't we don't have a national forum <coughs> for housing, or to date we haven't, um, which I think is a bit disappointing. We certainly do it in planning, um, where you know pe people get together nationally and you know talk through issues of concern nationally, and that's how we, the accessible housing changes that we uh, manage to get through into the building code of Australia. Um, so I, I guess that's an opportunity for us. Um, and look, I, I think, you know, venues like this are incredibly important um, to be able to um, ventilate ideas, to, to hear what other people are doing and to learn from it. And, you know, from my perspective, um, you know, we would, we're would we always happy to engage in those sorts of conversations. Um, you know, we're not the font of all knowledge. Of course we're not. I mean, um, you know, other states are doing important work as well and internationally. So we're learning yeah, we're learning from others as well, but um, you know we're you know we are very keen. And Trudy's right. I mean, you know, I mean we're still got RMIT who do some very good work um, in the housing space, um, but uh, you know we need to understand that for people, for many people, um, well, you know, I can only speak for myself. I mean, you know, there's no better gig going around than being involved in housing. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we've got to get the message out and get more people into it. Um, Luke, a question for you and from the floor. I know um, the interaction between yourself and your, your part of um, uh, the agency is with local government. Uh, the question from uh, Mike Collins is this, what, what does the panel think about the skill development need in government, especially local government, and should there be a development fund for this cohort as well? Mm -hmm. 
Sure, thanks, Mike and uh, Mark, and, and thanks also, Mike, for for that question about local government. You know, we are taking a very different approach to working with local government and working with them as a genuine partner uh, in the way we want to work in Homes Victoria going forward. We've committed to develop a compact with local government, and that will really give local government a proper seat at the table when it comes to planning for the needs of housing in their communities, because we know that local governments are so close to the needs of those communities, both in the social needs, but also in the urban planning needs uh, in, in local neighbourhoods. So um, we are committing to work differently with local government. We've um, done a round of um, initial engagement on the big housing build with all local governments across Victoria and have met with um, all CEOs. And then we've, we're now doing kind of deep dive sessions with local governments where there's a particular need for social housing or a particular um, uh, concern in their communities about um, what kind of stock gets built. So that partnership is a different approach to the way we've worked in the past and really does give local government that seat at the table. In terms of skill development, um, we obviously work really closely with the Planning Institute of Australia to deliver training and, and education sessions, but also very keen to hear from local government what else, what support they would like from us um, and from the government in order to be able to support um, social and affordable housing growth. That's a bit for me, Minister, I don't know if there's yeah. um, something you want to yeah, add to that. Yeah, no, thanks, Luke. A um, couple of really important points that um, Luke has just made there. I mean, we are, through the big housing build, we are entering into a compact with local government. Uh, and we do, you know, I, as Mark, you introduced, I did come from a local government background as well. Uh, so I'm acutely aware of the partnership that we need to have with local government. And in all of our projects above um, 10 units, um, we, we, have, um, we have modified... Um, our planning arrangements um, so that there will not be third party appeal rights available. Now that's that's quite different to every other state. I mean, New South Wales does not have third party appeal rights. I'm not so sure about some of the other jurisdictions, but that is very important because we need to get these projects away, but we're not gonna ride roughshod over communities. We're gonna take communities with us and we are fair dinkum uh, in terms of how we're actually going to consult with communities in a very respectful way. But, you know, we cannot be in a position for all the reasons I talked about in my uh, initial presentation around both the, <clears throat> the social outcomes, but the economic outcomes, the employment outcomes, uh, the investment outcomes that we're getting from these projects, that, <coughs> that they be unnecessarily held up uh, through um, a third party appeal rights process. The other thing that I would say, Mark, is that we have been completely swamped by local governments wanting to partner with us. Um, and if there are local governments on the call here today in Victoria who have not been a part of the conversation with us, get on board because we are absolutely keen to partner with local governments. And what does that mean? It means um, let me give you an example. Very early on, after the announcement, one I won't name the council, one of the smallest councils in Victoria got on one of these things with me, the mayor and the CEO, uh, and they said to me, well, look, we've had for a long time a little bit of a, uh, a housing... We managed some houses, um, which sort of go back to the dark days of probably the early days of the Housing Commission, I suspect, and I think they've got eight or 10 properties that they manage across their rural municipality. Now, this is one of the poorest councils in Victoria. They said to me, I oh, would like to, um, we'd like to develop, you know, and Luke was on the call with me, I think, I think six or eight units, something of that order. Um, you know, could we get into your program? And I said, oh, well, that's, that's terrific. Um, what do you, what's, what's your proposition? Uh, they're going to put in land. They're going to put. They're going to borrow, Mark, five hundred thousand dollars. Now understand, this is a small, one of the smallest and poorest councils in Victoria, to get this project up and away. Well, I mean, what do you think the answer has to be? Of course, I mean. So the the answer the answer is we are deeply committed to working with local government, and one of the keys and. Steve and others who, who are involved in development know this absolutely. If someone's coming with land, they're coming with a, a huge asset 
in their in their pocket because we know that depending on where the land is, it it, it can be from anywhere between ten and thirty percent of the development cost of these projects is in land. So if someone's prepared to put that up, it makes the whole equation entirely different, Mark. And you know, and what becomes a target of twelve thousand that we're looking at um, through the big housing build maybe becomes 13, 14, 15,000 uh, because you're bringing other, other plays into the, into the conversation. So, um, you know, we, we're thrilled with um, uh, the number of local governments who are actively engaging with us. And that tiny little council in rural Victoria is just one example. Yeah, no, brilliant. And, and Minister, just conscious of time too, but there's a, um, just a question kind of linked was um, you mentioned that the, the social housing growth fund was oversubscribed, so demand barn is key there. Um, how how over demand or how oversubscribed was it is the question from the floor. And do you see there being more phases of, of this as a number of interstate, interstate community housing providers bring in equity and debt to further grow social and affordable housing in Vic? Uh, I might just, uh, I'll, I'll defer that to Luke who, who perhaps we probably won't give you the number at this stage because we will be announcing some of this shortly. Yeah. Um, uh, but in terms of, of further iterations, I might, I might just flick to Luke for that, if yeah. I can, Mark. Yep. So, so in Victoria, we put uh, $1.4 billion into the social housing growth fund as part of the 5.3 billion uh, big housing build. Uh, and in the, the first rapid grants round, which um, closed uh, earlier this year in March, as, as the minister said, we had an overwhelming response to that. Um, but absolutely, there'll be further rounds of social housing growth fund, and, and hopefully, the round, the rapid grants round, will um, be public soon, as the minister mentioned. The the minister also talked before about some of those cohort targets: Aboriginal housing, mental health, family violence, and regional. You know, we know that through the rapid grants round, community housing providers had a lot of shovel ready projects. Those projects didn't always meet all of those different cohort needs that we're aiming to deliver through. Um, big housing build. So expect, I, I think you can expect that future rounds will we'll make sure that we're meeting those cohort targets around mental health, family violence, um, and regional in particular. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you, Luke. There is a couple of questions that we probably won't get to, but there's one here that I'm keen just to... Oh, we can do a couple more, Mark, if you like, and then we can you, knock you, off. Have you, got, have you got the time? Yeah, yeah, we could do, say, another 10. Yeah, 10, 10 questions. No, no, <laughs> uh, no. I just cheeked the. I thought I'd ask. No, no. Another ten minutes. That's fine, Minister. Appreciate that. Um, no let, let's go to this one. Um, and it's and it's a it's a key one. Can there be some more discussion regarding how we take communities along with us? Many myths abound. There was a project around many years ago dispelling the myths about public housing, et cetera, et cetera. It'd be a great time to have a similar project running a, alongside the big build. Is that what? What are your thoughts on that? Uh, it's it's a great struggle, isn't it? Um, you know, how many times have I been at public meetings, you know, where you, you front up to these events and people say, no, 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 no. We absolutely support public and social housing. Not fantastic. We love it. Look, our only problem, oh, it's car parking or it's traffic. Um, only once, only once have I ever been, it was in my electorate, um, where I went to a, a public meeting, you know, and you can imagine, this is North Fitzroy, this is, for those who don't know Melbourne, this is, you know, the creme de la creme of the inner city, uh, where a couple of hundred people turn up, and some bloke, to, you know, to his great credit, actually got up, you know, it was a pretty wild meeting, um, turned to the crowd and said, um, I don't support public housing or social housing. I don't want these poor people living here. I'm going, well, good on you, buddy. At least you at least you told the truth about what you actually think. So I had a we've got a project we're doing in 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 Hawthorne. Um, great project. Um, a bloke a bloke writes to me. He says, oh look, you know, um, we pay you know, really big rates here, um, you know, and we've got really good amenity here. Um, I don't want these people living anywhere near me because I'm worried about my children's safety. And you sort of go, oh, my God, have we got... 
We've got a long way to go, Mark. We've got a long way to go. And that's why the sorts of projects that we're putting in place, particularly where we've got mixed developments and some of the stuff that we're doing, the public housing renewal program, is about demystifying and actually saying that uh, housing, our public and social housing offering in the future must be more reflective of the communities that surround them. And that's one of the goals that we need to achieve. And, you know, there are doctrinaire people in the broader um, uh, political discourse, I don't need to name them, who, who only take one view, that it's, that it's public housing, you know, this, this social housing mob, you're, you're not the real deal. You're actually not supporting the people who um, need to be supported. It's a nonsense. It's a complete nonsense, uh, and I will repudiate it at every turn. Yeah, I mean, this is not for me, Mark, some sort of um, uh, intellectual exercise. I mean, if I stand at my front veranda here, and as you can see, I'm here in my house. Uh, at the end of my street is one of the biggest public housing high-rise estates. So this is not some intellectual thing for me. This is a community that I live in. This is a community that I shop in. This is my community. And, um, you know, I, I'm just, we have to take this on and we have to say to people that these, um, these, um, these, this conversation has to change. Um, and, you know, we all have a responsibility in that respect. Yeah, absolutely. Sorry, I, I, get, a, I get a bit carried away on this but no 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 I could, I could, we can sense your passion which is wonderful Trudy I know Haven's done a lot of work in this in this space in engaging with communities have you, you got any more uh, that to add to the minister's statement around that oh, absolutely and I completely um, understand your passion minister it's certainly how we all feel in the community housing sector and I think you know to, to layer that a little bit is that you know during lockdown we personally Haven Home Safe uh, had over 14 and a half thousand phone calls between I think March and October. Not all of those people had access to the homeless service system before. COVID has uh, brought to life a new, um, a new, new person seeking our services. And I think to going to the point Minister has made is, is people shouldn't be in fear of poverty because there are so many different layers and elements to that. So I think communities are seeing um, the impact that something like a pandemic can have on what it looks like from a housing crisis perspective. But I suppose more generally, um, even last week, I think it was the community housing um, group and all the Marcoms people met with Chia Vic and, and Homes Victoria and are working on a communication strategy. And that communication strategy is absolutely aimed at dispelling those myths and about um, taking the opportunity to really highlight the complementary nature of the whole social and affordable housing space. I think we need to go beyond the fact that, you know, it's either one or the other. Like we are not competing against one another. We are complementing the services for very vulnerable people. And that is something that we need to highlight, the incredible work that we all do. Um, in, in, in Victoria and certainly across Australia in supporting people who are really vulnerable and, and need our service and our support, not yeah. our judgment. Well said, Trudy. Yeah, absolutely. And, and Steve, I might throw to you on the same, uh, one of the comments coming through here um, around CHL and the great work that you've done over, over the journey in grass uh, root style community development. I, I assume you would concur with what's being said around the way that we need to... Oh, do completely. Um, the guy, as the Minister was talking about the planning meetings, I've been to numerous ones uh, where every excuse is made rather than pinning the real issue. And it disappoints me that uh, we even had an issue last year of exactly the same notes in... A community in East, Gip in, not in East Gippsland, Gippsland, which uh, I was surprised having similar attitudes or so even now. And uh, but our job is to engage the communities in which we work and to introduce the people who are living there to each other and to take a degree of a leadership role there. And, uh, and even within the developments we have, we need to innovate ourselves as an organisation by certainly allocating people from the Victorian Housing Register into those projects 
but ensure that the people who are living around also are engaged and introduced so that everybody understands each other and that we are all equal yeah. citizens in, the, in Victoria and have I, a right to live there. I should also just, uh, the corollary to that earlier conversation, um, Mark, around the, the, public, uh, the um, public meeting, we built the housing. Uh, it fits beautifully in North Fitzroy. Yeah. Uh, all of the surrounding community uh, uh, were actively engaged in its design uh, and have been extraordinarily supportive of what is a, <clears throat> a beautiful project, very well located, um, and um, just a great outcome. Yeah, brilliant. Um, Minister, do you, time for one last question. Yeah, one more. Yeah, one more. Okay. Um, and, uh, and apologies to those who, the couple of questions that we haven't been able to get to, but um, um, the question from the floor is, Minister, you mentioned planning system reform happening at the same time. Yeah. Is the key goal of the reform to fast track approval as per the previous Fed stimulus build? Yeah, you're right. Um, and uh, that's a person who knows his history, obviously. The Rudd Initiative, um, uh, effective. I mean, we have actually built upon the Rudd Initiative. So the planning um, scheme, uh, the amendments that were made effectively uh, address the question of third party appeal rights for projects over 10, uh, 10 units. Um, 10 and less, we think, you know, could eat, can very easily be managed by uh, local authorities. Um, and, you know, we're very hopeful that they will um, continue to be, you know, supportive of us, but, and particularly where we're, we're in, a, in a partnership with them, um, so as, as, as I've indicated. Um, and we don't do this lightly. Um, I mean, obviously, uh, that's, a, that's a pretty big decision to have, to have been made. But we want to ensure through the compact that Luke talked about that we are going to continue to have a deep and meaningful relationship with local councils uh, in terms of the consultative processes prior to um, any approvals. The other thing that I should say, and I've forgotten, I've forgotten to say this, um, although obviously I'm the Minister for Planning, <clears throat> but in this context, I cannot be both the proponent, as in the Minister for Housing, and the decision maker as the Minister for Planning. Clearly, you're conflicted. So all of the projects will completely bypass me as a Minister for Planning and will be both assessed um, and independently approved uh, by my colleague, uh, Minister D'Ambrosio, for the yeah. obvious reasons. Yeah, brilliant. All right, well, we might, um, we might call <coughs> a halt to this discussion, uh, Minister, but um, I want to firstly, Thank you for your the generosity of your time. Now I understand from your office you're you're soon to take a bit of a break, and I think you're probably about a busy, busy twelve months. So I hope you come back uh, rested and refreshed. Uh, but again, thank you very much for your time and extending your available time for the, these ten minutes. Um, Luke, Steve, and Trudy, thank you to you guys. Thanks so much for your time and input in today's panel. And I want to thank everyone who's on the call today. We will be making available a recording of the um, of the discussion, and that'll be on the um, AHI uh, learning platform. So we'll get that out to you fairly shortly. So um, again, thank you. Thanks for everyone's time today, and again, Minister, thank you for yours. Thanks very much, Mark, and thanks everyone for being online today and your interest. Um, let's do it again sometime. Okay. Thank you. We'll take you up on thanks. that offer. Thank you. Good on you. Thanks. See you. Bye bye.